I wanted to um, talk about, just go over some of the most common uh, mortise and tenon joints and some of the various applications of the typical, the real mortise and tenon. Okay, by that I mean it's an actual, where the tenon is an actual extension of the workpiece and it's a square mortise like this. Okay, so here's. Here's the example. This is a, a nicely fit mortise and tenon. This is a uh, 5 16 mortise here. And you can notice how it's nicely squared off at the top and the bottom. Very traditional in appearance. And then the tenon, which fits nicely and snugly. And we, I don't know if you can pick it up on the camera, but just with hand pressure, you should be able to close it up so there is no gap there. You really don't want to see a gap on the outside or the inside if it's fitted truly well. Now these, I also cut a miter on them. Um, this is just for showing you because this table has another tenon coming in at a right angle. And if you didn't miter them, they wouldn't fit all the way. So uh, these tenons are a full one inch on these guys. So anyway, that's a standard tenon. Now notice that it drops down from the top of the leg. It doesn't extend all the way out and through the top. And that's because what you want to do is create a strong kind of socket for the tenon to fit into and have good glue surface on the sides here. The main glue surface of the mortise and tenon joint is the side grain. We have the long fibers running this way and then on the tenon you have the fibers running perpendicular but there's not enough movement on this piece to uh, weaken that joint. So you get a really nice glue joint with all those side grain fibers gluing up to the side grain fibers here. Now you really don't get a lot of strength with the end grain here. And this is the shoulder. These are the shoulder of the tenon. All right, so all of the end grain is coming up and out through this surface. So if we zoomed in on that, if you saw the, the episode about wood, you'd see all these little porous, these holes in there. So the glue tends to wick into those pores and you don't get quite as good a bond as you do with the side grain. So I always end, you always end up with glue coming out and getting on that grain. So there is some strength, but that is actually not the true strength of the joint. It has a lot to do with the glue surface of the uh, tenon into the socket. But once it's seated, the shoulder is very strong because you've got those those shoulders are locking it in from twisting and giving you a solid stop. Now, just a little bit of terminology. If you think of, I just think of the tenon as a little stick figure man. So if this was a man standing there and this, he's got kind of an angled hat on. He's French. He's got this angled um, beret on, all right? So usually uh, we have a square head. <laughs> But this is his head, and these are his shoulders. So the shoulders come out, and his head comes up, and then these side walls are called the cheeks, almost like the cheeks of his face, of his head sticking up. So this is the cheek of the tenon joint, and these are the shoulders. The shoulder is what you really see when the joint seats up. So that's basically a fundamental mortise and tenon. I usually step down on a table like this about five-eighths of an inch. Um, you can go a little shorter, I guess. I, I'm just a little nervous about this because if you go the sh too short, what you have are very short grain fibers there, and it's easy to split the top of the leg. So sometimes when you're assembling, you inadvertently twist it a little bit, and you can easily crack that at the top which really isn't a big problem because you can squeeze some glue in there 
and clamp it up at the same time you clamp up the leg. But still, it's, it's not what you want to be doing regularly. So I found that stepping down 5 eighths of an inch gives you a good amount of grain there to stay together and a strong housed joint. Okay, so that's that. All right, now I want to show you a few variations on this uh, mortise and tenon. This is actually the joint I just showed you. This is it applied to a table. This is the hall table project, and it's very simple. It's got these three inch rails coming in with that tenon going into the leg from both directions. And then we've added, as you can see, these dark pegs, which actually function. They go fully through the tenon, back into the leg, and they're driven in solid wood pegs. So I put those in after the glue is done and you get a really sweet look and an additional reinforcement. It's really overkill with modern glues, especially if you have a nicely fitting mortise and tenon, but it makes a, a pretty interesting traditional appearance to the leg. So that's that typical mortise and tenon. I want to show you a few of the other types of mortise and tenons. Here's one that's interesting. You see this a lot on craftsman style furniture where the tenon goes all the way through. You see that? So you come in from both sides. The, the mortise, I'm so, and the mortise is cut all the way through, so the tenon can actually go all the way through and extend out the other side. So Usually you see this in uh, craftsman style furniture and the tenon is chamfered. It's, it's proud. It sits proud about almost an eighth of an inch typically. And you chamfer the edge and burnish it. It looks really sweet. Uh, this is, this is a, another joint. We actually would do this in the joinery essentials class. But this one goes in, slams up tight to the shoulder. And then you, we cut a couple slots to add the, the wedges to it. Now, you have to chisel a very slight long taper on the top and bottom of the exit side of that joint. So you can take these little, I use oak wedges. And normally I would put a little clamp pressure on here to pull up that shoulder tightly before the wedges are tapped and driven home. And they spread the upper and bottom part of that tenon to lock it in for good. Once you put the glue on there, and I put a little glue on the wedges, and drive them in, spreads out, and now you have a flared tenon that couldn't come out if you wanted to. But it's a really sweet joint. Normally when I do my through tenons on craftsman style furniture, I don't wedge them. I mean, it's, if you fit them well, you get a nice snug top and bottom and there's really not any reason to. But in some cases you may want that added structural strength for it to hold. It's a pretty cool joint and it looks nice. You can impress your friends. This, this is one that is glued up so you can see how it's left proud and the edges are just chamfered. And then you can see those two oak wedges in there. And this is all cherry, just as this is. And how it finishes, it's really nice because you're seeing the end grain there. It's the same cherry material as the legs, but because the end grain is porous and you're seeing all the ends, it just goes darker as it takes in the finish and also, it doesn't reflect light the same as the side grain, so you get that dark appearance. It's pretty sweet, huh? And that was just glued up as a demonstration. I mean, that is a really strong joint that'll be together for some time. Um, so those are two of the basic uh, tenons. That's a little pushing it a little further. And then we have Another mortise and tenon that's commonly used on chairs, and that is an angled tenon. You see that angle? It's got that kicking over 
angle so that the tenon comes down and it's at an angle to the end. And the shoulders are also at an angle. So when it's fitted in, it comes out at an angle. Now, you can see that on an assembled chair here. This is a Craftsman chair project, actually, that where we have the rail comes in, and then it kicks back at that same angle. So the tenon is angled, and the shoulder on the back here is angled. So that's a compound cut, and there's a pretty interesting technique for cutting those, but that's, that's a, a little advanced to go into tonight. Um, but we've got, it's super strong. I mean, the mortise and tenon joint, I could just stand on these rails. I mean, look, at they're only three inches high, and this is oak, and I'm a little over 200 pounds. A little shy about admitting that, but <laughs> actually, so this is super strong. I mean, I could jump on it, but I'll probably break my leg before that rail breaks. So it's a great construction for chairs in general. When you construct it like this, you'll see these chairs around in 200 years. They will not come apart because how well they're fit, they're glued up. And this one actually gets pegs as well. So I, I didn't finish pegging this whole thing, but these front tenons got a single peg in this case. Pretty cool look there. And then there's also tenons up here in this crest rail that also get a little peg here. So everything, all of these joints will get pegged. This is the shoe of the chair, and that also is pegged in there. And these backrest or splat pieces, also a tenon in there. So this craftsman chair is just a great study in mortise and tenon joinery and traditional chair making. So those are that type of tenon. Then sometimes you have a tenon that is longer into the leg and you don't want to make a single slot, but you want to break it up with a little bridge of wood like this. So this is for a, an oval table. I used to make these, uh, these Queen Anne tables that uh, I actually saw in Pug Moore's living room when I was apprenticing down, down there, and I loved it. And this is, this is very cool. This we'll have to talk about some night. This is a turned Queen Anne leg. So it's, you have Queen Anne legs that are actually sawn out where you saw out the curve for the Queen Anne leg. And then, but this one is offset turned. So the, the main um, spindle of the leg comes down on the heel of this pad. But the pad itself is in the center of that circle. So there's two axis points on the foot. And you turn those separately. So we turn the foot on one axis, and then it's kicked back. And you turn the main slender taper of the leg on the second axis. So it's kind of whipping around a little bit and a little intimidating for the first time you try it, but it's quite safe. Um, I've only been to the hospital twice doing this. <laughs> Not just kidding. Never been to the hospital. <laughs> so it's, you turn that taper, but you're left with a transition that you can't turn all the way. So you have to actually do a little handwork to blend that taper into the foot. But it is much quicker than sawing out and shaping the leg. So that, that I love that table. But it gives you this deep apron. I mean, that's almost seven inches deep. Um, and that's about as far as you want to push it for grain movement. Otherwise, you'll start to get the board wanting to crack once it's glued up. But I've had these tables, and they never do crack here. You cut some scalloping into it, pretty deep scalloping. So it allows for, there's less stress actually on it wanting to crack right there. But in order to give you the strength, this bridge is left here because if you leave this long socket, what you get is almost like a, a flap of wood here. It becomes too long for it to maintain 
like a kind of a housing strength of a socket around the tenon. So by putting that bridge in there, you stiffen up the joint and you give yourself two tenons, but it's just simple. You just mark it out and you cut the tenon the same, but you want to cut a little um, gap in the middle so it'll span the bridge. And when that's glued up, you end up getting a very nice strong tenon um, in there and the leg strength is also maintained. So I call that a, a double tenon or a bridge tenon. I don't know. I just made that up. <laughs> but you just got to do it on the, when it's a long enough situation. And it's more of a feel. I, I can't give you an exact, but I, I would say when you get up over five inches wide, a little over that, you got to start thinking about breaking up the tenon. It's just too, too weak of a, of a socket. Okay. Um, now, I've also got what I want to show you on this little demo here is this joint here. And this is a double or a twin tenon. So you've got these side-by-side -side tenons set up like this. Now, we've got these. These are actually excellent for creating a good, strong, horizontal, thin piece just like this. Awesome for drawer dividers. See, when that goes in, it indexes it square to the leg. And it also gives you a great kind of strength for such a thin piece. Now, you might say, Tom, why wouldn't you just put the, the tenon horizontally? Why wouldn't we have like a, this, just one of these, but flipped, running perpendicular? So... It would be almost as if I would be putting like this tenon in. So I'd be coming across. Why couldn't we just do that? Well, you could do that. But it would be an inherently weaker joint. Because what you would have is the tenon coming in and the mortise would be across the grain. So the vast majority of the glue surface area, if I can draw this. I'll just use, this is a good time for the purple chalk. <laughs> so let's say we made our mortise like that. Okay, and we stopped. Now, and it was thicker, something like that. Okay, it was nice and square. Well, what we would have is end grain here and end grain here. Okay, so when we would bring that in, we would have the, the tenon would be coming in perpendicular to all that end grain, and it would be an inherently weaker joint. Okay? When you do something like this, now you've got two tenons side by side, and all that side grain of the tenons is bearing against the sides of those, those two mortise sockets. And when it goes in, it's so, it fits so nicely. And you get great strength and more resistance to twisting. So it takes a little more setting up to cut this. But I get a very cool technique of cutting this, too. Um, there's a couple different ways. Of course, you can do it old school and mark it out with a, a marking gauge with the two-pin point and chisel it out. These are cut, I cut these with on the table saw using some spacer block um, techniques. Um, or if they're exactly the same thickness as these are, you can, when you're on the, the, um, the mortiser, you can cut one from this reference side and the other from this. And then when you cut your tenons, you do the same from each side. That only works if these are exactly the same and you set it up so that the offset is exactly the same from the mortise to the face and the tenon to the face. Otherwise, it won't seat up like this one. That's sweet. Nice joint. So that's a twin tenon. 
Now let me show you this little table that we've made so many times in classes that uses these two key tenon joints. So here we have the, the double tenon or the bridge tenon in the back that I broke up and it was on the borderline of needing to be broken up. Probably could get away with the, just a single tenon back here, but I broke it up so that we'd all have the exercise to do it anyway. And so here's the back of this table. So we've cut that and it fits right in there nicely. And we've got on this table, we've got a nice flush surface. Now the front, this is actually going to have a drawer unlike that hall table. Um, so we needed to put a lower drawer divider in here and we use the twin tenon technique. So that goes in and it gives you a really nice strong lower divider and if you marked it out well and you squared it across and those are, those are square across the bottom, it's self-squaring. When it goes in, it locks in and it's square to the opening. Then we would take our other half, this is already glued up, and it already has the, the um, infill pieces for the drawer. Then we'll take this and bring it over, and it works right down into the other, mirroring and fitting in nicely. So those would be glued up, and you'd have a really nice assembly for a single drawer bedside table. Um, it could be made a little lower and be next to a sofa, but usually next to a sofa they're deeper because most sofas are quite deep. You can have your lamp back here, but next to a bed, this is just right because you don't want too deep that way. Um, but once you've got the, this assembled, we actually do a dovetail into the top because if you put a tenon in here, it's going to obviously be coming out the top and you don't get the mechanical strength that a little dovetail offers. So this is the actual elegant kind of um, solution, mechanically strong way to set up a light little divider to create the opening for the drawer. And I'll just show you the drawer. I know the suspense is killing you. This goes in so nicely. Very traditional with the solid bottom. And it's all hand plane to fit just right. And then the top would go on and be something like this. Let me turn it around. Go on and be something like that. So this is a nice table, but you see the the twin tenon employed there and that double tenon a double high tenon in the back, right? This is a back of a Queen Anne seat. We've got the shoe, very much more decorative than the shoe on the craftsman chair. But anyway, from my library, I got this Queen Anne chair back with the double tenon on the bottom. And you do want to break that up because you can see with a tenon on a chair, we always, the mortise is quite close to the back. It's only a quarter inch thick tenon, but you're left with about three sixteenths of material. So if you didn't add that bridge, this would be much weaker, but I can't even press that in. It's quite strong because they're fairly short. And the back splat is typically a half inch thick. So that gives us just about a sixteenth offset on the front. So when a splat like this is inserted, this is an extra piece, that's why this is here. I couldn't put it on the full set. I think we made like 14 that time. But look at that, beautiful joint, comes together and it's super strong and gives you a great assembly. The top of the crest rail, I mean the splat is also the same going into the crest rail. And chairs are fun because there's a lot of interesting complex joinery that is is um, challenging but rewarding be, to, to execute because you feel that sense of accomplishment and competence as a craftsman. It's really the test as you start to 
go up in, in your experience with various projects. Chair making is one of those bars when you accomplish that, it feels like, wow, I'm really starting to be quite the craftsman. And <laughs> people will notice. <laughs> Actually, I'll notice. So I am, that's a great, another way to use that uh, double tenant. And then the last one I'll just talk about briefly because this isn't all the tenons, mortises and tenons I've shown you so far are basically for tables and chairs, kind of the bones for structural furniture that's made to last a long time. In this case, this is a frame and panel. Um, I don't I have an example of the panel, but this is not the actual panel. It's, it's a raised panel that goes in here. But the frame, this is very traditional. I got this from a library that was built in 1800 in uh, North Carolina. And I had to build a whole other library using that as the model. So this is the a little mock-up piece, but we've got an actual tenon, mortise and tenon construction with this groove going all the way around to accept the raised panel. So again, it's stepped down slightly, and then we have our, our mitered corner. Now sometimes, when you're building a frame and panel like this, we don't actually step down all the way here. We have, a, we have our regular tenon, and then there's a short little tenon at the top called a haunch. And those are especially useful on frame and panels because they resist this material going out of shape and it keeps everything aligned and flat to one another. Um, this is a pretty narrow rail, so there's not much problem or likelihood you would need the haunch in this case. Um, so I didn't add it. But sometimes you'll have like a frame and panel set up like this. And this is a back of a chest of drawers. Look at that. I love, I love making these because they're quite fast actually. But I've got these raised panels in here. And this is the way I do the backs of chests quite often. They're raised and then I leave them flat on the outside. This is the outside. So no one really sees the fact that you've got this raise, and that's okay. It's kind of a nice discovery when you look inside the chest one day. You see that. But look at the top how we've got this little quarter-inch stubby tenon, and that's the depth of the groove that all these panels are floating in. So that's a little stubby tenon. But that doesn't mean the tenon is only that long. That's a haunch. I had a haunch. You were going to ask me about this. So I thought I would show it before someone asked. So that's only a quarter inch haunch, and then it steps down the half inch, and then you get your full tenon. Now, I can't prove it to you because this is glued up, but I do have another piece that's identical that shows you the setup. So you get a little haunch, which is actually the same depth as the entire groove. So you just run that groove first, and then I use the groove as my guide to then plunge and cut those mortises to accept the longer one inch tenon. So that makes a true strong frame. You could probably get by just putting in that little quarter inch tenon. And that's the way a lot of kitchen, modern kitchen cabinets are made. They just use the profile of the cutters and you get a tiny little tenon like that. But you know what? If it's fit well and the glue is good, they'll probably last a long time, at least till styles go out and you want to change the cabinets in the kitchen. <laughs> but for a cabinet like this, it's going to be around for a couple hundred years, you want to make it to last. Um, so I just like having a true tenon there. And these in here also have full tenons, but we have that little haunch there that keeps everything aligned all the way out. These are all what we call true tenons. They are extensions of the actual rail. The tenon is integral to the rail. It's an extension of the fibers of the rail. Now, there are these other things called floating tenons.
and the floating tenon is a, almost as strong as a true tenon, but it's much faster to cut when you have the right tools. And so I'll show you that method. I do want to mention one other thing. What about when you want to cut a tenon on a long rail, like a two by eight? Um, that often happens in bed making. Um, and I don't mean making the bed in the morning. I mean making the bed. <laughs> making the bed to last. And I like to make the bed with traditional mortises, mortise and tenons. And you don't need a long tenon, but I use this shorter tenon and employ the old bed bolts that go through the post and then they capture a nut that I seat in a mortise here. So the bolt comes in through the post into the hole in the end of the tenon and then catches into a nut and locks so tight. It's like a timber frame construction. I, I built a jig that easily cuts this tenon using a router setup. Very cool setup, very, not that hard to make. And if you're going to be making a lot of beds, well worth your time uh, setting it up. All right, so let me show you really quickly. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all the nuances of the mortiser and the, and the tenon cutting, but I do want to show you the quick method that I use to do this. Now, this is going to be my rail for this little demo, and this is going to be a mortise and tenon very similar to the one on this taper. So we'll step down five-eighths of an inch. All right, so let's see. I marked it somewhere. All right, so this is my face. This will be my face right here. And this is the other face. So I'm going to have a mortise coming in here if this is a face. And then there's another one. Here's my other face, this side. So I need my other mortise to be coming in right about here. I'm way too intense for this point. 0.5 lead. So we got a scribble there and a scribble there. So that's the approximate location of my mortises. Now all I have to do is mark the height of the mortise or the extension because the mortise distance from this face will be determined by the mortiser, which you'll see in a minute. And it cuts the mortises super fast. So to set up the mortises, I would take one of my rails, which are uniform, and I just set the square, wow, that's almost perfect, isn't it? I didn't even pre-do that. All right, so we're, we're flush with the end here. And I could go, yeah, I'll go just flush perfectly, okay? And then I'll lock this down. Now I'll bring in the square, and I'm going to just hold it on the top of the leg and make a little pencil mark right there. Okay, so now I'm going to, when I cut this mortise, I'm going to leave that pencil line just barely. I want to make the cut right to the pencil line, but leaving it fully. If I do that, this rail will fit perfectly flush to the top, which is what I want. Because when I set this up, I was flush here. So the entire pencil line is outside the joint. So if I leave it, I'm going to get a nice flush fit on the top, which is what I want. Okay. Now I'm going to step down from the top, after I've marked all these out, I would then just change the setup and bring it down to my 5 eighths and make a little mark right here. Okay. And I would do the same over here and, of course, there. But I'm just going to show you this one. All right. So let's go over to the mortiser and we'll cut this mortise. All right, so I'm going to lock this in against the fence. This is my hollow chisel mortar, so this is a floor model. Now they do make bench top models that are quite, quite a lot less expensive. Um, I think you can get a good bench top model for like 400 bucks. You guys could correct me if I'm wrong. But this is nice because we, we have the lock in here. We don't have to hold it against with our thumb like my first versions were always. Now I've set the the cutter, which is, this is a 5 16ths hollow chisel mortiser. So you have a drill bit spinning inside a hollow square chisel, 5 16 square. I set it 3 eighths of an inch from the fence. That's the offset I want. I'm going to lock this in. And it's also parallel on the back to the fence. So 
it's set up. Now, to set it up, I would just bring it down and hit the material. Now I'm at zero. And let's say I want, I want to make a one inch deep mortise. So this is my little spacer piece that's one inch high. See, it says it right there. <laughs> and so I'm going to loosen my depth stop. And this right now is zero. Okay, so when I hit the wood, my depth stop is hitting the stop. So I'm zero right there. Whatever I raise the depth stop is the amount I'm going to gain in the plunge. So I'm just going to raise the depth stop pin, just put my one inch spacer in there, and snug down on it and lock it down. Now I have to take this out or it doesn't work. <laughs> so now I'm going to plunge from that point where I'm zero and I'll get that inch depth perfectly. All right, so here we go. I'm going to leave the pencil line and move right on across and stop at the top. Right. So I do that with all of them. Check it out. Nice, clean, square mortise. And then I would bring it around this way and make sure that my face was against the fence for cutting the other one. That's why these scribbles are so useful. So you don't space out and cut it with the wrong reference to the fence. I want to always see that cutter coming down to my pencil line, which I offset to show me where to cut it accurately. All right, so we're all set there. Now we're going to head over to the table saw to cut our tenon. This is going to be my example for the mortise. So I want it to come in. This is the same rail that we used to set it up. So I can see, let's look at this way. When I get this piece flush with the top, see how you you just see the pencil line, barely see the slit of the mortise. And this is the way most mortises are cut for tables and chairs, where you have an apron or a chair rail. The bottom of the rail indexes and sits on the bottom of the mortise. Okay, You don't really need to offset this. It's underneath the rail. So even if you miss slightly and you had a little gap, whatever, it's no big deal. It's under the rail, and by the time you finish it, it's practically disappeared. But if anyone did see it, you'd say, hey, that's the proof. This is an amazing mortise, true, authentic mortise and tenon chair or table. So you got that going for you. <laughs> All right, so this is the face, and this is going to be set in here. And we're going to, we could set this up to be flush like the table I showed you earlier, or in this case, I'm going to offset it. And I like an offset of 330 seconds. You might ask why. It's because 1 16th always seems not enough, and 1 8th seems like too much. So I got it right there. You don't believe me, do you? But it is. That's 3.30 seconds. So when I'm at 3.30 seconds, I'm going to take my pencil and make a nice little mark right on that, right on that side of the tenon, okay? Oops. Oh, I shifted a little. I could have just told you that that was perfect, but it wasn't. So I'm going to do it again. <laughs> now, I don't have my rule here. That's why I'm not measuring it, but I can eyeball it pretty close. So that's... Right there, that offset is about 3.30 seconds. So I'm going to hold it still this time and just make a pencil line. See that? Right there. So I want to cut this off right to the line. And then I'm going to end up with the other side as well. 
but I've got a little spacer for that, so I just need this one, okay? So, now I'm going to set up my saw. Um, I guess I do need that rule after all. I'm going to set the blade. I think I'll just, I'm actually just going to cut 7 8 inch tenons so we don't have to clean out that mortise um, right now. So there it is, 7 8 I'm a little, well actually I want to be a little lower than the 7 8 Okay, so I see the apex of the blade. It's a little lower. I'm going to stop there. Okay. I'm just cutting the cheeks first. Now, to cut these cheeks, I like to use a tending jig like this. Some of you have seen this before. It's really practical and helpful. It actually is a box built around the fence. And then it has a backer block attached to the box. So I'm able to push forward and use my fence, move it easily, and cut beautiful tenons. I don't need the accessory and the metal piece with all the crank candles and all that. It's right here on your fence. And it's cheap. All right, so I'm going to set it up with the face of my rail toward the fence so that when I was mortising, I set the face of the leg to the fence. And now to get my accurate offset, I'm going to set the face here. But first, I'm going to use this handy-dandy spacer block, which is actually calibrated to cut a tenon that will be 5 16 See, it says it right there. 516 and all this does is it saves us from having to move the fence to cut the other side of the tenon. It's going to move when I take it out, it, the piece is going to slide over 5 16 of an inch plus the saw curve because we got to get to the other side of the blade. So it's technically it's about 7 16 of an inch thick because my curve is an eighth inch. All right, so that's what this piece was set up to. Now, it doesn't always come out perfect when you make this. Sometimes I'll, I'll use a piece of uh, wood that I plane. I like to use plywood because it's dimensionally more stable. And I've got a piece of uh, Baltic birch here. But it was a little thin. So all you have to do is put on layers of tape to get just the precise fit. And you do this by fitting it and testing it and all that. So I'm going to set this up now, bring up my saw, my jig, and bring over one of the tooths that's flared, one of the tooths, <laughs> one of the teeth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm going to chew it, my tooths. And uh, I'm going to bring it over and just set it up so that tooth is right on my pencil line. See that? Perfect. All right, and I lock it in. Now, I want to do that with the, the spacer in there because I'll make this one cut for that cheek. Then I'm going to remove the spacer and see this will slide over and it's going to get the other side. So it slides over the 5 16 plus the thickness of the blade or to get you to the other side. And then it leaves us with a nice 5 16 tenon. All right, here we go. Let's give this one a cut. All right, that's all there is to it. So, of course, I'd run all my rails at the same time with the same setup, always keeping the face to the fence. Now I'm left with these little tabs of wood, and I need to cut my shoulders. Those look pretty equal. It doesn't always happen that way. Lots of times the tenon is offset one side or another. That's why I don't prefer that dado method where you have the dado cutter, and you cut from one side and you flip it over. It usually requires you to change the height of the blade, and it also is dependent on having all your stock the same uniform thickness, which doesn't always happen either. When you reference off the face and cut your tenon using a spacer block, it doesn't matter how thick the piece is or if the tenon's offset. 
cuts it perfect every time. That's why I really like that spacer jig. All right, so I'm going to set this block in here. This is, I'm just using as a backer, plus it helps you to hold it a little. When I was working with Pug down in the shop in North Carolina, we used to, we used to just do it like this. <laughs> oh, we were just, we would use the fence and just run it across, drop the blade, run it across, and then flip it and run the other. Now, if your surface is nice and square and parallel, you know, square to the end, you're indexing off the end. So when you make that cut and then the other cut, the beauty of this method is you know that those two shoulders will be in the same plane around because you've indexed off the same end. So that's another way to make a really crisp, well-fitting tenon simply. Okay. So I'm going to set this up. I'm just going to cut set up to be like 7 A's. good and I'm gonna drop down the blade so I just I don't want to I don't mind scoring the tenon but I don't want to be cutting into it you know too much because we want to preserve that nice tenon now I'm gonna make I want to just make sure that this end is staying tight against the fence but I'm gonna make two passes because when I make that first cut, that little wedge of wood is going to be trapped between the blade and the fence, and it's going to want to kick out. So I'm just going to get that out of there quickly. See, I didn't have a fresh back on my, um, my tenon, so I got a little tear out there, which probably won't get fully taken away. But normally, you'd have a fresh backer piece on here. See, I didn't go the full height of that tenon. If I, or oh, that cot, that was already there. And that's probably one inch high. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and make this cut. And I'll make it in a couple passes. Here we go. All right, so I should have set that up to the thinner side, but that's not even a big deal. I scored into the tenon a little bit, but barely, okay? Um, what you want to do is I usually set up and cut the, the smaller offset first, and then we flip, and we can just chisel away if we don't get it completely on the other one that's further offset from the front. All right, so that's good. Let's head back to the bench, and I'll show you just fitting this up. This I could, I could use, and I could set up my um, square and mark down the, the 5 eighths. But here I'm just going to mark it right here. Now I'm going to go a little more because I don't need, um, it doesn't have to fit really tight up there. So I'm going to just make that little pencil line using my finger. As a stop, there's nothing magic about this. But I've got my stop locked in, so I'm going to mark it on the other side. <laughs> so that you can see when I saw this. I'm just going to saw this by hand. So I'll put it in my... If I've got a lot of these, I'll usually set up the fence on the bandsaw and make them all uniformly quickly. But I'll just do this one. And I'm going to use the back saw. I mean the dovetail saw here. Okay, don't, don't cut through your shoulder. And then I'll um, make this side cut here. Now I don't have to be right on this. For this I like to use the Japanese saw because I can start by using the shoulder kind of as a guide. And there's so little set on here, it doesn't hurt it. And then come across. And come down. Now it drifted by past the shoulder a little bit. That's okay. 
I left with a little bump of wood there. So if my chisel is really sharp, I can just pare it off like this. Or I can put it down on the bench and take um, my mallet. So what I'm doing is setting the chisel against the shoulder and sitting it right on that little bump of a tenon that didn't come off. Now I'm only going to do this about halfway so I don't blow out the other side by accident. And then I can flip it and do the same. I started paring this side so if it's really thin you can usually just pare it off and you don't have to do this. But this is a lot less effort. I mean it just takes a little bit longer time if you need to. So see I'd rather undercut that slightly so that I'm not fighting that. But you got to make sure that there's no rocking. If this is rocking, then you know you left a little too much in the middle. That will act as like a doorstop and want to keep it from sitting. Now, we're just going to make sure that everything's clean at the base of this joint because that will also keep it from seating. Now, I didn't calibrate. <laughs> recheck and calibrate my tenant spaces so I'm not sure how well this is going to fit but let's see oh fits good so that's fitting nicely very nice and snug now if it's not you can lightly rasp the side of it but if I can just put pressure on that and get it to pull up tightly that's pretty nice. I know that with the clamp, it's going to be nice and tight. I didn't clean out the bottom of that mortise. There's a little bit of fibers on it. Usually, you have to come into these hollow chisels and clean off those little fibers at the bottom. They act as stops as well. Even though I cut that at an inch, the, um, the square chisel doesn't go all the way to the bottom. So we clean that out. And then we can sit our tenon again. There we go. Now that felt like it hit solidly. Look at that. Beautiful tight joint. Both sides. Nice fit. That's just really strong, honest joinery. So let me take that apart. And that's how you want it to fit. You don't want, you don't want to be fighting it too much because if you are, when you get glue on there, it'll expand and you'll really have a fight on your hands. And you don't want it to just fall, fall in. It's too loose. When it falls in, I usually just hand plane uh, shaving and glue it right on there. Thicken up that tenon and you'll be back in business. All right. So that's my introduction to mortise and tenon joinery. There's so much variety, but it's so important and such a fundamental joint that I hope that helps if you've never had experience cutting them.